Good morning, All Nations Church. Bear with me. Clearly not my laptop or my iPad. <laughs> I'm not good at technology. If that's obvious, that is what's happening right now. Uh, why? No. Go away. I think this is as good as she's going to get. Sorry, can... Pastor Rick? Sorry. <laughs> Somebody that's more technically inclined? Uh, please, you don't invite that guy. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> What do you need? I need this gone. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Why is it? I know. Can you see me? Can we get rid of that? Somehow. Keep going, guys. Keep singing. Yeah. We'll give him the glory in this technical malfunction as well, right? My fat fingers. My fat fingers. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Justin. My fat fingers. Whatever. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> All right. Good morning, All Nations Church. If I haven't met you before, my name is Caitlin Uliak. Uh, my family and I have been serving here since day one. Myself and my husband, Carter, we have a crazy 21-month-old toddler. Um, his name is Levi. Always so happy, so joy-filled. You'll often find him in the lobby or in the hallways dancing. He is always around a speaker. This is his latest. So if you see a child doing that, he belongs to us. Um, so happy. He's such a happy kid, and we're just so thankful for him. I have the privilege of leading our First Impressions team. So those are the amazing people that do above and beyond everything when it comes to uh, setting up a welcoming space in the lobby, greeting you at the door, serving you coffee, and just doing an amazing job at just welcoming you in to go all in during service. Uh, myself and Carter have recently been uh, teaming up with an incredible group of parents and starting up our Youth Nation, so we're super pumped about that. Hoping to launch in the new year, so we're just really excited for what God is doing here in uh, our church as well as our community. And if you, at, if you have youth at home, send them our way. We want to know them. We want to get to know them. And yeah, we're just super excited. So let's just dive into the word. Father God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity and the honor to share your word this morning. I just pray, God, that um, your seeds would be planted and they would be sown in the hearts of everybody that is here or streaming online, God. I just pray that um, your Holy Spirit would reveal to us what we need to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I was asked to preach during the At The Movie series, conveniently, close to Christmas, <laughs> I had to pick a Christmas classic, The Grinch. And when I say The Grinch, I mean the Jim Carrey version, not the cartoon from a long time ago or the new one, the Jim Carrey rich version. And I don't think anybody else had picked a Christmas movie, so this is your little sprinkle of Christmas cheer at the beginning of the month of December. But I have always loved this movie. This is my favorite movie growing up, and it's still my favorite movie to this day. And I know it very well quite well, enough to say that I know every line, every word, every lyric that is sung, every sound effect that the Grinch makes, and I would like to consider it a talent. I could stand up here and we could spend the next 35 minutes and I could do a one-man show of the Grinch for you, but Pastor Rick said no. <laughs> I don't think there's anything spiritual about that. We are in church. Um, but I like to consider it a talent. There are some people that find it annoying. One of those people being my sister. <laughs> so every time we go to watch a Christmas movie before a play is pressed, there is a very stern conversation. And when I say stern, it's on her side, not mine. <laughs> she goes, sis, if you say one word, it gets shut off. Just like that, killing my Christmas spirit, killing my joy, killing the happiness, but I'm very thankful that Carter is much more tolerant of my idiosyncrasies. Um, but anyways, we're just going to watch a few clips. Ask any who, and they'll have this to say, there is no place like Whoville, 
around Christmas Day. Every window was flocked, every lamppost was dressed, and the Whoville band marched in their Christmassy best. Jingle bells, jingle bells, Arbor Day was fine, and Easter was pleasant, and every St. Fizzin's Day they ate a fizz pheasant. But every who knew, from their twelve toes to their snout, they loved Christmas the most, without a single who doubt. <laughs> Got a snoozle phone for your brother Drew, and a snoozle phone for your brother Stu, a monkle for your uncle, a fan for your aunt, and a fan pie for your cousin Leon. So we just need Cindy. Cindy Lou. Cindy. Oh, hello, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Excuse me. Cindy Lou, honey. Dad? Yeah? Doesn't this seem like a bit much? This is what Christmas is all about. Can't you feel it? Merry Christmas! Thank you for coming. Wait a second! Don't forget your change! Another minute! Closer to Christmas! Wow! And for the next five minutes only, 99% off! No lights on in the house. Your mom must be shopping. Oh, good. I'm so glad you're home. Oh, I can feel it, Lou. This is the year when everybody asks who has the most spectacular lights in all of Greater Whoville. They're going to cry out, Mrs. Betty Lou Who. Isn't this the chandelier from the dining room? It's all for the cause, dear. Oh, and Cindy, could you be Mommy's little helper and unscrew the bulb there from the refrigerator? Because somehow I missed that one. Go ahead. <laughs> Every year, Martha May Cuvier has the best lights. Well, not this year. This year, I'm gonna beat that prim, perfect little prissy daddy. Hi! Martha! My, I've never seen so many beautiful Christmas lights, Betty Lou. Well, I'd blow every fuse if I tried to keep up with you, Martha May. Isn't this antique, darling? It's handcrafted and almost a hundred years old. Sweet. I'm really impressed. This, however, is new. The Grinch is such a good movie. One of my favorites. Justin had to just put up with me for a little bit. But I don't think any version will ever beat the Jim Carrey version. And we see underlying issues with both the Grinch as well as the Who's. The world is so chaotic and so hectic during this Christmas season while we see sweet Cindy Lou Who and the Grinch trying to figure out what the purpose is of the season in such a period of darkness and loneliness. But today I want to focus on the Who's. We see from the beginning that Christmas is their thing. It is what they strive for, and they strive for the perfect Christmas in every form and capacity. Because every who that we can measure knows that Christmas is a time that we must treasure. But we see that as they're shoving people out of the way during the flash sale, almost trampling over some people, putting up their best Christmas light display, and wearing their Christmassy best all the time. And Cindy Lou is looking around, watching everybody lose their marbles on the extremes that they're going through to capture this perfect Christmas, while the true meaning and the heart behind it is sadly forgotten. And I love the conversation between her and her dad. Dad, isn't this just a bit much? Well, that's what Christmas is all about. Don't you feel it? While there is heaps of presents that are still being counted for, and she is completely blended in. Their idea of treasure is found in the objects and the presentation around Christmas. It's an added pressure during the season to fulfill this grand idea of what Christmas should look like. And for us, we can experience a similar kind of pressure. 
you might already be feeling overwhelmed by the weight that Christmas could bring. Maybe you grew up with having divorced parents, so you're struggling to fit every parenting set within your plans for the month while you want to start your own family traditions. Or maybe yourself, you could be divorced and you're struggling with trying to share your children with the respective parents. Or maybe you don't have family in town and you long for that massive family dinner like at the end of the Grinch where they have that big row of tables upon tables and somebody's yelling out, who wants the gizzard? (laughs) But you know that there's a chance that you might be alone. Or maybe you're the spouse that's going to be working on Christmas. So you know you're going to be walking down the street in probably minus 20, just being realistic. And you're walking to the bus stop, and you're looking into the windows, and you're seeing these moments that you wish that you were having with your family, but instead you're going to work. Times are tough right now, so you might not have the ability to do the kind of Christmas that you want to do for your family. And yes, these are real situations that the Who's might not have experienced at all, but I believe that there are two postures that we can take this Christmas that will allow us to savor moments within the season rather than push and strive through until it's over. Rather than participating in the hectic and the, and the natural busyness of it, can we make an intentional decision today at the beginning of December that could change the trajectory of the month and have more peace and joy in our hearts and our homes? I brought up my sister earlier because we're going to be unpacking a tale of two sisters and their experiences with Jesus in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42 this morning. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teachings. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. And in another translation, verse 42 says, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. I wanted to look and compare these two perspectives between these two sisters, because I believe that we might actually be able to identify with both of them this Christmas season. So we see Martha, she invites him into his home, into her home, and she's under the pressure of serving this beautiful, gourmet cooked meal. And women in the house, let's be real, she's probably simultaneously cleaning at the same time. Anybody else? I swear my kitchen is always the dirtiest when there's somebody sitting in the living room and I'm trying to prepare a meal. So I could imagine that Martha is getting pretty ticked when she is trying to present this perfect, restful, peaceful experience for Jesus, but instead she has nothing but chaotic emotions building up. And instead of realizing that she's putting this pressure on herself, she feels that her sister's help would completely remove it all. And I could imagine, sorry, technical difficulties again, guys. Okay, there we go. And I could imagine she's in the kitchen. She's looking down, and she sees this interaction happening. And she's there, and she's cooking up a storm. She's whisking. She's baking. She's making soup. I don't know what she's doing. And she probably has sweat beating down her forehead. Her hair is all disheveled. She probably has soup and flour on her dress. And she looks at Mary. How dare she have a beautiful experience with Jesus when I'm in the kitchen? And she becomes unglued. This is not working. Sorry, guys. Okay, there we go. No. But the thing is that Jesus never asked her or put the pressure on her to have it all together. He never asked her to create this beautiful meal and slave in the kitchen over this meal. Yes, her desire for caring for him is an admirable way, but she's so caught up in what she needed to do that she forgot who she was doing it for. And she delivers this speech that she probably rehearsed 50 times before she spoke it. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Lord, do you not care? Lord, do you not care that I'm completely doing this for you and on my own? 
Lord, do you not see me striving and not thriving? Lord, do you not care that I'm stretched beyond my capacity and trying to hold everything together in this crazy and uncertain world? Lord, do you still not care that I don't have a job and I can't give my children presents this year? Lord, do you not care that I've cried out to you so many times about how lonely I am and how broken I am? Do you not care that I've been diagnosed with this disease and I'm still sick? Do you not care that my marriage is still struggling and we have to fake it through the Christmas season in front of our in-laws? You fill in your, break, your blank. Do you not care? So that is one posture taken by Martha. But Jesus' response to Martha highlights Mary's posture. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. I can imagine her gleaming at Jesus' feet, just soaking in every word that he speaks, noticing every detail about him, and clearly not so much about Martha causing a ruckus in the kitchen. He has her full, undivided attention in this moment, and no one or no task will pull this focus away. Her desire to be with him isn't pressured or forced, but it's genuine worship and adoration. And in John 12, verse 1 to 3, we see another dinner party take place at Martha's. It was a celebration because Jesus had just raised Martha and Mary's brother Lazarus from the dead. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner party was prepared in Jesus' honor, and Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with them. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume f made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with fragrance. And it's not specific as to when this account took place in relation to the first dinner party. However, it seeks, speaks to Mary's drastic acts of worship. She is later than criticized by Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, since he considered it to actually be a waste to have been poured over Jesus. He says in verse 5, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? In Matthew 20, it references this concept of one denarii, which is one day's worth of work. And in Alberta today, the minimum wage is $15. So if we do the math which I did before because I'm not good at math unless we have a calculator. Multiply that by 12 hours a day. You're looking at $180. Multiply that by 300 since this bottle of perfume was equivalent, equivalent to 300 denarii. You're looking at a $54,000 bottle of perfume. Broken. That bottle can't be put back together. The oil can't be swept back up. And it's poured over the head of Jesus running down his body. I can't think of a single item in our home that is worth anything close to that. And if anything, Carter would just buy a really good bar of soap before coming anything close to that. And she wiped his feet with her hair. The sandals that they wore had minimal coverage, so you could imagine how dusty and how dirty his feet were and how callous his feet were from walking miles upon miles. That was the most precious and most valuable thing that she possessed. And it was the only fitting thing and the fitting act that she could do to express her worship and love for him. So that is Mary's posture. These two sisters have extreme polar opposite approaches to how they spent their time with Jesus. And there could be a lot of discussion about Jesus in our homes. But what happens when we go to the mall, the concerts, the parades, the parties? Do we get caught up like the who's of Whoville, like Martha, and like Martha? Are we feeling the pressure with our jam-packed schedules because we commit to everything possible and wanting to portray that we're having a Pinterest Christmas and then also comparing to others on social media? Well, she made 50 batches of cookies, and their entire living room is coated with presents, and every peak on his house has lights on it, and they're able to give to every single charity that they come into contact with. Or are we going into the season like Mary? sitting and gleaming at Jesus, giving him the best of our time and the best of our gifts in this moment. And the reality is that he didn't come into this world for a day, not even for a season, but for each and every day. And I want to point out some ideas on how we could keep Jesus at the center of the season and maybe even deepen our relationship with him this season. The first one is to slow down. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. 
There's a season to be productive. There's a season to be busy, but there's also a season to slow down. If you're an individual or a family that spends the year going from an activity to the next commitment to work and to school, it's time to slow down. The obvious thing that we can see from Mary's posture that was to ignore everyone and clearly everything to sit at Jesus' feet. She could have joined into the frantic cooking in the kitchen, but she chose what was most important to her. It could look like being selective with the extra dinner parties that you commit to and saying no to some Christmas parties. Where you put your yeses to indirectly affects where you're going to put your noes to. So if you're saying yes to volunteering and yes to these extra gatherings, you're saying no to precious love time with your loved ones. The Christmas season naturally comes with a sense of busyness, which it can be our biggest distraction from spending the time and the energy in the places where it truly matters. So if we don't tell our time where to go, our schedules are suddenly flooded, and the busyness floods our hearts and our minds and our homes with chaos rather than joy and peace. Martha was consumed by the things that caused her to be anxious and troubled. If seeing others celebrating their Christmas makes you feel like you're not doing enough, Take a break from social media. Be content with what you're able to do this season because the trap of comparison will rob you of your joy and, if anything, exhaust you. We have to choose to change the atmosphere inside our hearts and the atmosphere will change outside in the surroundings where we might be a part of. We don't have to be a part of the busyness at the mall, the grocery store, or the parking lot. We can remain joy-filled regardless of the situation that we're walking through. So down. Saying no is an answer, and that is okay. You don't have to give an explanation. It is also okay to do less and do it amazingly. I know that's not a word, but amazingly. (laughs) Then do a lot and be left feeling disappointed. The next thing is intentionality. What do you want your season to look like? Make an intentional decision today and stick to it. Mary chose to spend her time with Jesus, and as Jesus said, there's one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken from her. I want to spend more time as a family. I want to create a very special Christmas for our son. But naturally, we have commitments. We have things that we can't say no to. But I believe that we can give undivided attention and time to our loved ones. And youth, I am speaking to you too. We know that you have friends you want to play catch up with. We know that you'd rather hang out with friends rather than your parents. Sorry, I was one. But it's much easier when you're all together under the same roof because you're going to be 27 one day and you're going to wish you had while you could. And moms, I have an amazing resource for you. It's simple but fun activities. It's called the Advent Prep Club. You can message me. I'll give you my login. But it's easy to incorporate affordable, quick, little activities that make Christmas special without overrunning your schedules. Maybe it's being intentional with sharing the love of Jesus into moments throughout the day. And whether that's reaching out to somebody in need, doing something special for a friend. And my sister, she used to always pull the, well, my presence is your present line. <laughs> Any other sibling? Just got it. you got to have heard it before. But I was okay with it. I loved it because the reality was we were going through post-secondary. She lived in other cities. And we didn't have the money to spend on each other, but we always made the intentional moves to be together, and that always meant more. This could also be the Christmas season where you make traditions that don't stop. It could be praying more, doing family devotions, or deciding to serve on one of our teams for the first time. And I want to jump back to John 12, verse 7, where Jesus says to Judas, after Mary pours the perfume over him and wipes his feet with her hair, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Mary knew to some degree that Jesus' time with them wasn't going to last much longer. And she knew this because she chose to intentionally spend time with him. She picked up on little components in his teachings that the disciples missed. And a quote I read this week, shared by Risen Motherhood, really hit home with me. As we deck our halls this season... May the lights and decor serve not as a means to adorn ourselves with any glory of perfection, but to draw our eyes to the one who hung on the tree so that his perfection could be ours. So we talked about slowing down. We talked about intentionality. The next thing is worship. It's easy to lose Jesus in the craziness of Christmas. Although he should be a focal point, he often becomes an afterthought. 
Mary worshiped at his feet. Mary poured sweet perfume that cost her everything without a question. How are we worshiping? Do we have a posture of worship in our actions and our conversations? And I'm being cheesy and using the cliche statement, but is the reason still in the season in our hearts and our home? Are we still speaking Jesus over situations that we face that when we're disappointed, hurt, heartbroken, and overwhelmed? When we praise him and worship him, we're switching the focus off our circumstance and back to the source. The source where the joy of the Lord is our strength. And you might be sitting in here and you're thinking, Caitlin, you have no idea what my Christmas is looking like. You don't know what I'm walking through. And you're right, I don't. But I do know that you can have joy-filled moments throughout this season where you can still look at your circumstance and still see Jesus amidst it. It's looking at your child in the simplest of moments, nothing grand, and seeing them smile. It's a sink full of dishes that previously have food on it. It's the extra long hug that you needed because you just can't hold it together anymore. And it's the friend that's speaking life into your situation, saying, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm standing with you, and he's got this. Worship gets you back to the source. And when you give him your best that you have to offer in that moment, he reaches down and gives you his best, which is always more than enough. Psalms 23 verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord together forever. In some ways, Martha's willingness to serve was an incredible act of worship. And we're so grateful for every adult and child who serves here at All Nations Church. But it was the posture of her heart that wasn't worshiping Jesus. It was distracted. And can I encourage you this morning? If you currently find yourself in Martha's shoes where you're in the kitchen asking, Lord, do you not care? I can tell you that he does. In Ephesians 3, verse 18, it says, And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. But just because it's Christmas doesn't mean that your circumstance or your emotions suddenly goes away for a month. And however, I want to encourage you, don't stay in the kitchen like Martha, but bring yourself to the feet of Jesus in the living room and let him carry you. Bring it all and exchange it for his healing, for his freedom, his unconditional love, his faithfulness, for his peace, and his ability to provide. Psalms 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. What if we were a church that chose to have the posture of Mary, even though at times we feel like Martha? What if we chose to not get caught up in the consumerism like the Who's and simplified the season? leaving us with less pressure. I think people would notice. Others would see that we are a body of people who have genuine joy from Jesus Christ, rather than joining in with the grand idea of what Christmas should look like. We, the church, could be the vessels that bring order to chaos. We can simplify the Western way of doing Christmas through lowering the world's ideas and increasing Jesus in this season. Normalize the smaller yet more intimate gatherings. Normalize serving M&M's appies and independent desserts so you're more focused around the people in the living room rather being caught up in the kitchen. We can be people who walk through Christmas bringing hope and light to the darkest situations people face where there's heartbreak, pain, and uncertainty. People would smell the fragrance of our worship in our homes when they come over for dinner. We could be the Cindy Lou Who's who tries to shift culture and the norm to bring the heart of being together and being more kingdom-minded. I read a quote by Rich Viotis who said, In a world torn by rage and anxiety, one of the greatest gifts followers of Jesus are called to offer is a simple, non-anxious, calming presence. Not a presence removed from this reality, but a presence that refuses to be shaped by it. We can usher in this calming presence and not be shaped by the chaos around us. Focus on slowing down in this fast-paced, instant culture. Soak and savor in this season. Be intentional with where we invest our commitments and the development of the kind of fragrance we want in our homes and keeping Christ at the center of our worship and giving him the best that we can this season. We can make the decision today 
that this will be the most joy-filled season and keep his light radiating in our hearts that will affect the darkness and the evil that we see in this world. But today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you fear going into another season with having no hope or peace, you can make the best decision of your life today. It means that you're walking into every day anchored in him. And not even just every day of your life, but into eternity. Making Jesus your best friend truly is the best decision that you can make. You're not alone. His peace is attainable. His joy is attainable. His supernatural strength is always accessible. So if that's you this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we're going to make that commitment today. We're going to take the time to say a quick, simple little prayer. On the count of three, with every head bowed and eyes closed. One, two, three. Awesome. Great. Okay, we're gonna repeat a prayer and how about we just all do this all together, all nations family. Say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry I tried to live life without you. I give you permission to be the ruler and the leader in my life. I thank you for your sacrifice and for your undeserved love. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Good job, guys. If you made that decision today, we want to hear about it. So make sure you fill out the Connect card. Go into this season being more joy-filled. And like I said, your circumstances might not go, but you can always access the one who will walk beside you through every circumstance that you're facing. Awesome. Why don't you stand with us?